we're reading from Exodus 15, <coughs> 1 through to 18. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. He picked officers. His picked officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You sent out your fury. It consumed them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters peeled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desires shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew up your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples heard, they trembled. Pagan seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chief of Edom were dismayed. Trembling seized the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. By the might of your arm, they became still as a stone. Until your people, O Lord, passed by. Until the people who you acquired passed by. You brought them in and planted them on a mountain of your own possession. The place, O Lord, that you made your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Our second reading is Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord 
in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I served you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. final reading is from Revelation chapter 15 verses 1 to 4. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So, let us pray. Your Father, thank you that... Um, you have revealed yourself as one worthy of all praise. And we know this truth will be lived out through us forever and ever. Please give us some witness to such things tonight. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. So this number seven is called Music and Singing. Now before I start, I feel singularly incompetent to talk on this topic because I have nothing to, in my understanding repertoire of musical theory. Nevertheless, as a very young, enthusiastic believer, I dropped in one day to a so-called Divine Light Mission Camp. They were a group very active on the, on the streets in the 70s and they were Hindu-based and followed a guru, a guru, of course. What astounded me was when these cult members started their gathering by getting everyone to sing Amazing Grace. Now, does that seem strange? Does it seem impossible? Well, not if you sing only the verses we're familiar with, because they say nothing. There are many verses to Amazing Grace, right? But the ones we're familiar with say nothing about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is absent. That's why it's so popular in so many places with so many people. Anyway, so music's a powerful thing, but you have to discern it. Because sometimes what I discern in the music and the songs is dreadful. Okay. Um, from conversion on, I have enjoyed singing. And day by day, when I go out to pray every morning, when I'm fit enough to do that, I'll sing, and on the way back, I'll also sing. Something simple, like the doxology. I've adopted this practice. I'm out there by myself usually, and it's often dark. 
despite some stinging criticisms about my voice. <laughs> now, these days, I understand that those criticisms were part of a bigger plan that I might learn, it doesn't matter who it comes from, there's someone quite godly that criticised my voice and told me to shut up and give room for better singers. I've learnt such things that help me not to listen to myself or to how others might hear me, but to the fact that the Father is thrilled with Jesus and never desires anything more than the passion and love and singing, actually, offered to him by the Son of God. In our union with Christ, our Father is forever thrilled with our worship. How else do you think we'll be able to sing through eternity unless we're sustained by the energy and passion and joy of a Heavenly Father? As we grow in our union with Christ, we grow in spirit and in truth, we can sense more and more the Father's delight in our worship and the fulfilment of this remarkable prophecy in Zechariah, sorry, Zephaniah 3.17. Some of you would know it. It's actually been set to music. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He'll quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. The Lord sings. How wonderful. Well, what about singing today? What can we say about the atmosphere in many of the churches to do with singing? Well, it's hard to miss the fact, if you're familiar with church history, that whereas the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper was the focal point of God's presence in the ancient church and the pulpit resented everything at the time of the Reformation, today the action in many churches is believed to be in song. And because there's a poverty of good teaching across the church, the lack of prophetic and theological depth in many pastors flows into contemporary songs lacking the glory of the Trinitarian reality, the dynamic of the life of the Trinity. Because all energy, I mean all godly energy, all spiritual energy, all energy in worship must flow from the love that's shared from forever to forever, now with the church, between the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So when we see a lack of Trinitarian glory, which will involve talking about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when we see a lack of that in the songs of the church, we know we're in trouble, big trouble. The, the so-called popular Jesus has a status in our singing far inferior to his, identify, his identity as the glorified Son of God. De-emphasizing or reducing God's saving personal activity in Christ drives us to focus on the worshipper expressing their love and adoration to the Lord. Their understanding of true worship becomes located in me and my experience. I act as if I exalt God in the heavenlies so he will become pleased with me on earth. How ridiculous. But that's how it is out there, amongst the masses. More to say about that in a minute. It's all back to front. Jesus is the central actor, always responding to the Father and forever offering unsurpassable worship on my behalf to God, and yours too, to God in heaven captured by popular culture. An ignorant Western church has moved from hearty communal singing to being led by worship leaders at the head of professional quality teams of musicians. That's created a dominant performance and concert-like atmosphere in churches that bypasses the power of singing resident in ordinary Christians assembled in love for Jesus. Now you go into some of these big places and the music up the front is tremendous, but you look around and there's a small minority of people actually singing because they can't keep up the standard. 
because a lot of what is being sung is actually manufactured for, for sale. That's reality. I think this is like a much earlier time when the crowds in the Roman arenas created an atmosphere of spectacle that gripped the participants. So the rock concert today is a phenomenon that has invaded our megachurches and only a holy revival will ever dislodge its grip. We need a bigger story than the thrilling story that we're finding in the ecstasy of some of these huge churches. Well, we can go back to the beginning. And we can, we can read in Job, at the time of creation, Job 38, 17, at the time of creation, the morning stars sang together and all the son, sons of God shouted for joy. Now this is about the songs of angels because the songs of angels are a dimension of their being in praise and thankfulness to God for all his great works. The same wonderful spiritual atmosphere is also found in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30 and 31. I was beside him like a master workman. This is about wisdom, God's wisdom. I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his habit, inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. God created us in his own image and this was accompanied by his own ecstatic unbounded pleasure and the praise of all holy creation. Well, can you imagine what it's going to be like at the end? If the beginning was like that and the angels knew there was going to be a problem, what do you think the end's going to be like? Well, it's going to be wonderful forever. These Old Testament texts are important because they provide us with insights into God's plan in Christ, like in Revelation 4 and 5. The perfection of worship through the sacrifice of the Lamb. In Jesus, we're united to the total history of divine praise. Made in the image of God, human beings were symbolically destined to be like a multi-tuned, sorry, a multi-stringed instrument in God's hands, tuned to his ultimate glory. Since the fall, the fall brought a separation and reversal of natural human ability to thank God. The fall brought, turned blessing into cursing. Now, all the powers that hold body and soul together become antagonistic to the Father Creator. We are so lost, we are so out of tune as people, if you like, that nothing less than the complete coming of God as a human being can put us back into order, can retune us and tune us at a higher pitch. Is that right, higher pitch? <laughs> well, from the time God expelled humans from paradise and guarded any entry back into Eden by, ch by the cherubim, humanity has been groaning. Consciously or unconsciously, human beings groan for a return of the glory of God. Across the planet, Humans are seeking the manifest presence of God in every possible way. And that's why human history is always a history of idolatry. Always a history of idolatry. As human beings seek to substitute something, anything, from the one true glory of God. And idolatry is the background to the old covenant whereby God's sheer kindness, his presence was, was concentrated in the tabernacle and the temple. Now, through the gospel, the Lord who walked once with Adam and Eve in Eden walks amongst the seven golden, camps, seven golden candlesticks of the churches. 
he is fully accessible to us as a glorified human person. Our unshakable assurance of Jesus' presence can't be found in heightened experiences of spiritual ecstasy, though they are real. Such experiences are real. I mean, I've had enough of them in my own life. Heightened experiences of, of spiritual ecstasy. But our assurance is found in the power of his death. And are you familiar with the fact, a few of you may be, that the veil of the temple, the Old Testament temple, had embroidered all across it cherubim. So when the veil of the temple was torn in two at the time of the death of Jesus, every obstacle to entering fully into the holy place and the presence of God was taken away. Isn't that wonderful? It's true. Yeah, every obstacle has been taken away. Um, the gospel of Jesus has secured a radical transformation in humanity's condition before God. True worshippers, not like under the old covenant, true worshippers no longer stand outside the holy places. You know there are all these courts, the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, the court of men, the court of the Levitical priests, the court of the Aaronic priests, and the one place that the high priest can only go once a year. That's all taken away. Now, God has taken us into his very presence with him in Christ into heaven itself. Now, I've got a, something else I want to talk about, which is how Old Testament patterns of worship have come to dominate much of the church, which is a big error. Because Old Testament patterns of worship were great in the Old Testament period. Worship, to quote from Deuteronomy, is commanded the place that the Lord your God will choose and make his habitation there. So the presence of God was to be located where he decided. And that is central to old covenant devotion. And sometimes the language of God's presence used today in the church omits the centrality of Jesus. Despite wonderful promises uh, in terms of Old Testament worship, it was formal and ritualistic with patterns dependent on special times, special places, and special anointed worship leaders. Today, there's a popular understanding of praise and worship that involves a sequence of fast and slow worship songs to bring people into the presence of God or using the Old Testament pattern moving the congregation through the outer courts to the inner courts of the Holy of Holies or bringing people from a consciousness of what has been done for them to who has done it or as some would put it bringing people from praise to worship the final phase of this entering in is called experiencing the manifest presence of God. And this is all confusing. Because all of these degrees of approach to God, which are all based on Old Testament patterns of holiness, indicate that the worshipper's conscience has not been perfected by the blood of Christ. The real problem with all these confusions is the absence of the living Jesus. The Jesus whose sacrifice was so perfect that he took his blood with him into the most holy place in heaven and in doing that took us with him. Now, we're going to sing a song before I go on to talk about the worship of Jesus.
So my heading at this point is the worship of Jesus, which could mean worshipping Jesus or Jesus' own worship. But both of them are true and they're both perfect in him. Um, in a surprising way, the first mention of worship in the Bible points remarkably to the sacrifice of Christ. This is what we read in Genesis 22. Abraham says to his servants, stay here, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. This symbolises, of course, Jesus' death on the cross. While, while Genesis completes, is completely silent about Abraham's emotions in taking Isaac up to the altar of sacrifice, the surrender of Jesus as the one and only Son of God teaches us that however we may have mangled in the present time the connection between singing and worship, true worship demands from us everything. There is nothing that quite tests our spirituality like singing. Whilst, as I see it, most of the church imagines Jesus from a human point of view or according to the flesh, Few live in the revelation that Jesus himself is the beginning of the new creation. The Jesus presented in the Gospels, which is indispensable, the walking, talking, eating, suffering, dying and rising Jesus is not that challenging to most of the church. But the ascended heavenly Lord is altogether another matter. Important for our topic is that Jesus continues to have a rich worshipping life at the right hand of God on our behalf forever. To share in his heavenly worship, we must see that his whole glorious history of song stands in our place. We first encounter Christ as a singer in Matthew 26.30, where just after the last, last, last Supper, we read, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus was about to be arrested. The Last Supper was a Passover meal, which included special hymns known as Hallel, or praise the Lord, hymns. One of these is particularly powerful as Jesus heads out to his imminent arrest, trial and crucifixion, he leads his disciples in one of the great psalms, Psalm 116, which Donna read. Great psalm of God's faithfulness in delivering his servants from death. I'll read a few of the verses. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called out on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Our Lord was not deprived of the gift of praising his Father when he entered into heaven. Jesus is the perfect worshipper or singer, if you like, forever. In Romans, in Romans uh, chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, Paul applies David's victory psalm to what Jesus is doing. Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to conform, confirm the promise to the patriarchs. As it is written, Therefore, I will praise you among the nations and sing to your name. As the gospel spreads across the world, God receives praise through lives offered to him. And that's what Jesus is singing now and until the end. This chorus of song proceeds from the highest heaven across 
the world. And even more emphatic on this matter of Jesus as a singer uh, is the letter to the Hebrews. So we read this in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verse 10 to 12. For he who makes holy and those who are made holy all have one Father. That is why he, which is Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Now the word congregation is ecclesia, which is normally translated church. This means Jesus is tonight singing the praise of God in the midst of our praise. This is very clear. It's very biblical. Why don't we think about this? Why don't we accept it? I was guess the church is full of people who are poorly taught, actually. And this, this language of praising in the midst of the congregation comes from Psalm 22, 22. Now, you all know the first verse of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus prayed that on the cross. Today, he is in the church speaking from heaven of what the Father has accomplished in his life. He tirelessly de declares the delivering power of the one who we now call our Father. Christ sings in our singing. Going back a few years, the Pentecostals I knew as a young Christian loved Psalm 22.3 in the King James Version, which says, But thou art Lord, are holy. Thou inhabitest the praises of Israel, or the praises of his people. But they never explained this is true to, for us, that God is present inhabiting our praises because it's first true of his living in the praise of Christ who's in us the hope of glory. As soon as you attribute something to the church which leaves out Jesus, you're in trouble. It's a great scripture, but it must be fulfilled in terms of an understanding of Jesus. A, a gospel or Christ-centered approach to worship changes everything. It means that those, those who lead, lead singing and worship must live in the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of the sufferings, whatever their natural gifts. You know, because every now and then you hear of some famous worship leader who leaves Christianity. Well, why were they famous? It well, certainly wasn't because they had, a, had the spirit of the Lord. They didn't know Jesus. If worship is as deep as the life of Jesus, as deep as the cross, as deep as his ascension, its impact must be just as wide. The liturgy of heaven imparts order and harmony to the earthly realm of which it is, as fallen, intrinsically incapable. Why is there disorder everywhere? Because of the fall. There's increasing, always increasing disorder. So the creation is now in itself incapable of godly order. The church is meant to be different. It's meant to be a truly prophetic church. By faith and in the spirit of Jesus, we inhabit the new song that has been sung by the Lord over creation. The beginning of the world, a lament over the fall, and the new creation and the joy in Christ of resurrection life. This is part of the eternal plan of God, who's given those, given those who are in his image, which is all humanity, to be priests of creation through his service I'm quoting someone, the marvellous rationality, symmetry, harmony and beauty of God's creation are being brought to light and given expression in such a way that the whole universe is found to be 
a glorious hymn to the Creator. Now when you get into Revelation 4 and 5, you'll actually see the angels, the living creatures, make statements of faith that the whole universe is a hymn to God, the Creator. And the church is to live in that, by faith in it. Well, if the distinctive of the hymns we sing is the centrality of Christ, because they tell the story of the Messiah whose bloody death procured humanity's salvation and who is now resurrected and enthroned on God's right hand and is the powerful agent who rules the church and will one day rule the world, we must ask the question, why did God create us as musical beings to begin with? Why is it natural for people to sing, to love tunes and so on? Music has a power to release an inner non-rational part of our beings so that we can appreciate, share in and grow in the mystery of Christ. A means by which the heavenly, heavenly earth and earthly worship can be united in praise to God. That is, music has what might be called a mystical function. There's something more than the rational. When we go into the Old Testament, and particularly 1 Chronicles chapter 25, we'll find dynamic connections between music and prophecy. Like it or not, music and prophecy are really connected. Okay? So 1 Samuel 25, 1 says, David and the chiefs of the service then set apart for the service the sons of Asaph and so on, who prophesied prophesied with lyres, with harps, and with cymbals. They prophesied with musical instruments. Now I think this approximates what charismatic people call playing and singing in the spirit. Now some centuries later, they want, a, they want Elisha to give a prophetic word. So what does he do? He calls for a musician and then he prophesies. In the New Testament we read, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Lastly, in every sense, in the book of Revelation, trumpets and harps appear, signalling judgments and accompanying songs of redemption. It's all there. Because the word of Christ we sing is not just the word about Christ, it conveys Jesus' own living presence and his experience of victory over tribulation. There will always be tribulation. We are in the great tribulation, but Jesus is the victor over all tribulation. As the Lord and his assembled people, that's the church, sing along together, the delivering power of God in the gospel is conveyed. In union with Jesus, in, in union with his new song, the spirit goes on revealing the wisdom, the goodness and the victory of God in the life of Christ. Jesus declares through our praises his father's victory. And by inspiration from heaven, we declare this on earth to each other. This is how our hearts are strengthened to go on obeying the Lord in being living sacrifices, which is our spiritual worship. Now next week, and it's not next week, it's this week, I'm going to say that the survival of the church in Western society will come to depend on a great escalation, growth and maturity in its worship. And you'll hear that for yourself if you come. You have to believe me. 
well, it will happen anyway. Now, I'm at the conclusion. In God's plan in Christ, worship is to permanently and powerfully transform human being. To transform human being, even as the worship of Jesus, his perfect sacrificial life, which was his spiritual worship, it transformed his being. It glorified his being. As we worship the Lord, our spirits sense that in Christ, the time of ritualistic human effort is over. We see that in the incarnate life of the Son of God, we see that the one true and perfect mode of worship has come. Now, I have to say, most experiences of Christian worship are not like that. I might have mentioned earlier, um, when I was in this Pentecostal church, I came out one day, looked at my friend who I'd seen come to the Lord a little while before, and, and we said to one another, we come here Sunday by Sunday, and we say, as everybody else did, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and we are not changed. That was true, but it was part of God remoulding my understanding of many things. Someone has said, quite perceptively, the theological depth of the church's music can be correlated to the strength of the church's missionary endeavours in history. Right, so the theological depth of the church's songs and music is correlated to the richness of its missionary endeavours in history. We must accept that the ever-extending the, the ever dominion of Jesus through the earth awaits a great change in what we sing in the church. The popular music scene is building a faith that is simplistic, pleasure-oriented, emotionalist, intellectually weak, and influenced by market-driven entertainment, which is not pathetic, it's tragic. In his wisdom, God has allowed this to happen so that across the Western church there might be a hunger and thirst for his righteousness, an intense longing for the coming of Jesus, which will change everything. A contemporary prophetic writer comments on John Wesley in the 18th century and says, Wesley's great achievement was not that he sung his own song. Now, Andrew thinks he can improve some of these songs. That's quite possible. Not that he sang his own song, which he never promoted himself, but that he rediscovered God's song and sang it afresh over a new, newly emerging landscape. We live in the midst of a newly emerging social landscape, landscape, one far more radical than the expanding industrial, philosophical and political revolutions of John Wesley's day. For example, it's, some of this is about woke and postmodernism. The world of Christendom where everyone simply understood they were Christians has gone. And I've seen it go in my own lifetime. My own lifetime. And most of the church, especially in the United States, but here as well, is struggling to come to terms with this. And it tries to reinvent itself, reinvent itself, reinvent itself, but it keeps going down and down and down. We must accept that only when the fullness of the word joins the fullness of the spirit will we then see the greatest move of God the world has ever seen. That is the vision of you charismatic worship to the glory of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit.
Amen. Let me pray. Dear Father, we're very thankful that you have someone other than us to fill your heart with joy, love, peace and assurance. It's not about the church, it's not about each of us individually, it's always about Jesus. Please, by your spirit, through your word, redirect us again and again to the one whose singing is holy and perfect and pleasing to you, that in him your glory might be revealed through your church for the sake of the salvation of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.